We're back yes. after a long hiatus. Right? Well, you've been busy. We, I have been busy. Yes. Now, but I, I want to say, and I'm going to, uh, we're going to try to do this more often now. Okay. I see this as the kit getting back into it. Okay. And I think a realistic okay. goal is once a month. So hopefully okay. we can do it once a month. Um, anyway, we're, it's a little bit late, but it's before the Oscars. Mm -hmm. I don't even know when the Oscars are. I don't know. Uh, who cares anyway. But um, <laughs> we're going to do our favorite films of 2015. Okay. I'm going to let you start. Okay. Because um, you, you, you had the list and you have a better memory than I do. Okay. okay. Now, I'm going to go in order. I don't yeah. know how you're doing. I, I'm going to go in order as well. Okay. So, um, I saw uh, many films this year. This is the top ten, starting from number ten. The Connection, which okay. is a, a French film. We saw it together yes. at Film yes. Bar. Uh, it's a French film about, in some ways, the same subject matter that The French Connection and The French Connection 2 was about. Um, only this movie takes it from the French side, um, and it stars Jean Desjardins, and I forget the name of the actor who plays the drug dealer, but I was really surprised by this movie mm -hmm. because it didn't get the best of reviews. No. They kind of just said it's a typical Scorsese rip-off type thing, but I didn't think it was that at all. I thought it was riveting and um, a great crime thriller. And, uh, and it very, they packed so much story into mm -hmm. two hours, and I was really impressed by how they did it. So And his performance yes, was, was great. So, yeah, after having seen him in um, The Artist, right. uh, and then to see him play a, the polar opposite kind of character. He belongs, really interesting. he belongs to me to a different era of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I think he would have been even more kid. successful yeah. in the 40s or the 50s, because right. Right. he really recalls you know, the Yves Montand mm. or Alain Delon or the old Hollywood guys, you know, with his looks and his style. Yeah, and he brings so much heft right. to the screen when he walks on screen. Oh, yeah. His presence is sensational. Yeah. I mean, as he walks on, you have to pay attention. Yeah. Right, right. So this one, I, it slipped through the cracks. Yes, and I, I really think that people should, it's on, I believe, Amazon or Netflix now. Mm -hmm. One of those to stream for free. So people should really check mm -hmm. it out because I think it's, it's super entertaining. What's your, that, so that's my 10th pick. What's, okay. what's your first um, pick on your list? My 10th pick on my list um, was, I got, uh, all right, uh, Listen Up Marlon, uh, uh, the, the documentary on Brando. Not that it's the best documentary, but it gives us an insight into what possibly one of the most fascinating actor of the latter part of the 20th century. Right. Brando's always been sort of a mystery slash enigma. Uh, to everyone because he started out handsome uh, and brilliant and daring and then somewhere along the way he lost or he appeared to have lost whatever enthusiasm he had for the profession and for the industry and he let himself get very fat for one thing. Um, he played parts almost in a left-handed way uh, like he didn't care right. but there was nevertheless, even in the worst performances that he would give, which were deliberately bad, uh, there was always the nagging sense of the failed idealist. And the failed idealist being our inability to meet the certain high standards. And when I say, oh, I, meant, I really mean the industries. Mm -hmm. um, inability to meet the high standards that he expected of the profession. Um, not that he didn't want it to be entertaining, but he thought it should have more meaning. Um, and when he realized it was all about money, he just essentially gave up whatever right. ambition he had. The one regret that I, the one thing I regret is that because he did say he wanted to really give a final performance that was a powerhouse, at least as much of a power right. as he could give, and that was the one that David Lean, Nostromo, Nostromo yeah. that was going to do, and he was preparing for it, and then Lean died, right. and then they couldn't do it. But nevertheless, um, this Listen Up Marlin gives us some interesting insight into his own background, right. and the kind of demons that were driving him. So I liked it for that. My only regret with the movie, and we, again, yes. we saw it together, was that what you just said, I think, goes more in depth into, into Brando than sometimes the documentary did. And I wish that they 
dug a little harder. Mm -hmm. But especially for someone who I think doesn't know a lot about Brando, it's a great documentary. Yeah. Because yeah. it teaches you a lot that you don't know. Um, my next film is one of the worst reviewed movies of the year. Okay. Uh, Irrational Man, Woody Allen's uh -huh. film, is uh, my number nine pick. I, I never saw um, it. The movie got trashed. And uh, I went to go see it expecting it to be terrible. Because um, as we know, Woody Allen, um, here every once in a while will we'll deliver something just incredible, yeah, like Midnight in Paris, yeah. and then um, he'll he'll you know he'll he makes a movie every year he has for like the last thirty years, which is incredible, and a lot of them are misses. This one I didn't think was a miss. Um, it's a really interesting movie about this professor professor um, on the East Coast, and he's a philosophy professor. He gets involved in uh, a murder scheme. And it's similar in some ways to some of things that he's tried before, like in, um, what's the one, Matchpoint, mm -hmm. and Crimes and Misdemeanors. But, it, and it got criticized because it has all this pretentious dialogue in it. And I said, I wanted to tell the critics, can't you tell he's making fun of this world of academia <laughs> and, and philosophy? And that's what I thought was most fun about the movie, was it was clearly, to me, a satire. Mm -hmm. And I found myself next to my date who didn't laugh nearly as much laughing out loud constantly throughout the entire movie um so the joke worked for me whether it was intentional or not i think it was intentional it really worked and i also thought it was one of joaquin phoenix's best roles mm -hmm. he seemed to be not trying as hard mm -hmm. which is why it was so good because he wasn't in that method you know wrestling with the method kind of acting he was just sort of relaxed he's a bum he has a big beer belly mm -hmm. drinks a lot screws women a lot you know it's just a it's an interesting movie so i think well, you should try to see it that, um woody allen's personal direction is interesting because it's by indirection mm -hmm. and saying that i think that's what allows the actors to so relax yep. that because there's nothing that's established that they need to right. do. There's no bells they have to ring or standards there. And even when he, the only way they know that he doesn't like a scene is if he asks them to repeat it. Right. But he never tells them what is wrong with right. it. Just he a little them, bit louder, yeah. sometimes yeah. he says, or you know, yeah. this kind but of But he thing. lets them find it. Right. And that's the thing that, so I, like that. I would think that that's what they led to as you were saying, Joaquin Phoenix being so relaxed. Right. Because, you know, you, when, when it's that way, you just, you don't give up yourself. Right, you know, right. Like that. Um, my number eight is another documentary, and that is The Best of Enemies. Number eight or number nine? Or is it number nine? Number nine. Okay, it's The Best of Enemies. Cool. And we saw that together I like that well. movie a lot. And that's the one with Gore Vidal and William Buckley. Mm -hmm. And, um, Again, it's not the most in-depth documentary you can get, right. but the two personalities are so strong and so powerfully aligned against each other. And the enigma of their, you know, sort of marriage, as it were, as enemies, is so electrified that you wanted to see more. Right. As the, you know, the picture came and it, it um, showed, you know, the clashes, but... Um, when, it fit, when it was over, you wanted to just, gee, I'd like to see more of this. I'd like to hear more of that language because there were two very erudite men right. who really knew what they were about in terms of politics, philosophy, mm -hmm. um, social mores, etc. Yeah. And it was a real fencing match. Oh, yeah. uh, even the explosion of what's his name, of Buckley calling him a queer. Yeah. Um, even though we've seen it so many yes. times the way yes. they do it. Yeah. Uh, so, that was my number nine. It's I've I've seen it twice now. Yeah, I, I showed it to my yeah. parents, and uh, I honestly think it's one of the most entertaining movies yes. of the year. Yes. I mean, it's a documentary, <laughs> and people would maybe shy away from mm -hmm. that, think it's all information. This documentary is not all yes. information. It it's like true. watching a boxing match, I know. a good one, yes. <laughs> you know, or a fencing match, like you yes. said. And it also has some really um, sad revelations about the men mm -hmm. too i think it does a great job of getting into who they mm -hmm. were um as much as it can you know mm -hmm. in in two hours and some of the things that they say about them in their later lives um has really stayed with me right. and i've yeah. thought about it so i don't know i agree with you it's, it's really good um my next film is a movie that another movie we saw together but i know you weren't crazy about um it's called the keeping room 
-hmm. And it's a uh, Civil War drama thriller. Some people call it a Western. It certainly mm -hmm. has Western elements to it. It's about three women um, who were stuck in this house. And uh, it's right before Sherman's March. So there's these sort of Yankee scouts coming down through the South and raping and pillaging. And um, I won't tell you too much about it, but I, I just thought that it was a, a really well pieced together um, thriller with these great female characters. And uh, there was a lot of talk about it being a feminist movie. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that way. I just felt that, man, these are just some great, strong female yeah, characters yeah. who are really acting like women of that time, not women out of that, that time. time. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it also has... Um, just, just wonderful, uh, you know, directing and cinematography. So I just, I like the film, and and specifically the the lead actress Britt Marling, I think is is kind of a interesting up and comer. For me, I mean, I wasn't as excited about it, by it as you were, but I thought it was a solid picture. Right. And uh, a lot of plotting kind of went awry a little for me, mm -hmm. and that was the thing. Some of it seemed deliberate. But nevertheless, uh, it was one of the better pictures. It was one of those movies that, because I don't disagree with you, I think. I don't, can't explain why, but some films, even though when I'm watching them I can see the plot going that way mm -hmm. and making mistakes, I forgive it because I like the ambition and the drive. So I felt mm -hmm. some, I felt like with this movie, I'm like they're trying interesting things. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of forgave it for its faults, if that makes sense. What's okay. next for you? Um, the next for me is um, Spotlight. Okay. And, um, I'm surprised to hear that. Well, the reason for that is that it does take an interesting subject, uh, a subject that we've heard a lot about and we've read a lot about, and it dramatizes mm -hmm. um, a situation, particularly at the end. I mean, this, the subject is uh, Catholic priest abuse. I thought there were some sharp performances in the picture by everyone who was mm -hmm. involved. And Specifically it, for me, Liev Schreiber, I thought he yes, was just outstanding. Yes, Liev Schreiber was wonderful. Um, but across the board, I mean, mm -hmm. Michael Keaton and Mark Ruffalo, mm -hmm. and they all were, were really very, very solid in the performances. And I thought the writing, um, it, it could have been sharper, but I think it was enough. It satisfied um, my curiosity about it. And then the real revealing thing was the, the crawl at the end. Right. When they tell you all about how much abuse there was. And so I was just happy to see that uh, dramatized that way. And so when I looked at the stuff that I'd seen, um, when, we, when we left the theater, we talked about it and we kind of pulled it apart a little bit. But in comparison to some of the other things that are around, this stands out as one of the better ones. I think it's a solid movie. Mm -hmm. People seem to really like it. I was disappointed in it. Maybe at some point I'll have to reapproach it with mm -hmm. with just sort of uh, no expectations. Because mm -hmm. it's hard to walk into these movies, especially after they've gotten so much hype. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the best film of the year, and then you walk in and it's kind of, uh. mm -hmm. But if I ran into it, I'll say this, if I ran into it on TV one night mm -hmm. and didn't know anything about it, I would probably like it a lot more. And the best part of the movie is the list of right. cities at yes. the end of yes. where these things have happened. Um, my next one is a movie that could have easily stayed at number one, but it got pushed down throughout mm -hmm. the year. Um, Mad Max Fury Road, um, <laughs> which I loved because I, I won't talk too much about it. When I walked out of the film, my, my thought was, I have just seen inside the mind of a madman. That's what I felt like. I felt like I was uh, spent two hours inside the mind of uh, a crazy person, right? Not Mad Max, but mm -hmm. Mad Miller, Mad mm -hmm. George Miller, right? right. right. And it was just a pure, um, I thought, totally original um, genre mm -hmm. film. Um, most genre films are just repeats of so many, mm -hmm. so many things, I feel like. You go see Star Wars or Jurassic World or whatever. It's just a repeat of what's been done. And this was a sequel, but so much of it was new. The mm -hmm. images, the characters, and um, I like that. There was a lot of energy to it. Even when it was stupid, I, I remember thinking, this, this, you know, this is stupid. I'm like, but I can't fault it because it's so original, <laughs> right? So I loved it. Okay, I've seen it. You did yes. eventually see it. Yeah, not, not did you hate it? it? Yeah. Totally. Uh, I'm not surprised. I'll tell you what my feeling about it is. I think it's an age thing. 
because every young person I sp I've spoken to about it loves this picture. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm just too old for it. I really do. Um, and I've read enough reviews. I right. went back to read reviews and, you know, all the King's Hoffman and all the King's Men can't be wrong and be absolutely right. right. So I have to think I'm standing so completely out of the frame of it that I couldn't get with it from the beginning to the end. And to be fair, I don't think that my parents would like it either. Mm -hmm. They would think that it was noisy, junky, yes. all of that stuff. Exactly what I thought. So, yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad that you, you, like you said, a lot of people like it. Just like yeah, a lot yeah. of people like Spotlight. And, yes. you know, yeah. so. No, but in this case, it's even more than that. Right. You know, because you can see how Spotlight can draw people right. out. Thing. And you can even have an opinion, but I mean, I was so outside of the frame that I could not see one virtue to the entire <laughs> yeah. film. You yeah. see what I'm saying? And that's what I realize. Yeah, it's really an image That's thing. great. I'm too old for I it. love that. Yeah. That's funny. Right, what's next on your uh, list? Um, I have to go to this. Bridge of Spies. Okay, good choice. Um, again, you yeah, know, um, what has been happening in um, our film going experience is the well-made film is becoming obsolete right. and more than obsolete um, it's not being appreciated and that's what Spielberg is doing he creates a well-made picture where all the scenes are beautifully balanced it is handsomely photographed the acting is as terrific as you want acting to be mm -hmm. uh, and the script the same thing mm -hmm. and so you put it all together and you have this perfect sort of whole piece of bread that right. is nutritious and that is tasty right. and it they slip through the cracks it kind of like oh well that's expected you know plus it's based on a historical fact yeah right and so with that i just thought i couldn't really fault much of the picture at all right yeah you know, it really is just so balanced yeah i think that there's you would look back at some classics from the 40s and 50s mm -hmm. and if they were made today yeah. they would do nothing and yeah, get yeah. no attention exactly and the um, film has Classic profile. It does. I thought Hanks was just about as good as he's yes. ever been. I think he gets, you've said this, he gets better with age, mm -hmm. right? Better and better. And he's, more than that, you can't see him acting. He's so relaxed. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's um, like Spencer Tracy, you can't catch him acting. In the first half of the movie, um, I, I literally thought in the first half, this might be Spielberg's best film mm -hmm. because he's just so. Uh, he just knows where he wants everything mm -hmm. to be. You know what I mean? And he, he just, you know, he's there at that point in his career where he's the the old master mm -hmm. now, getting to be the old right. master. Yes. Um, I was like, what kind of you know? <laughs> Right. My favorite part of the movie was um, the ethical question, though. Mm -hmm. I really liked that that it asked um, in America if we don't defend our enemies, what does any of this mean? Yes. And I thought that in a very subtle way, he was making um, a really good point about everything around us in, in our culture right mm -hmm. now. And he's good at doing that without yes. hammering it home. And so, one of the things that we have to appreciate is the casting. Oh yeah. Because correct casting makes it, and to have somebody like Hank at the center yeah. asking those questions in such a low-key way right. uh, gives it more weight to the question than if it was being shouted or played right. in a larger uh, for, you know, manner. Uh, that's what helps to make that moral question that you say well, that is sent to work. He almost becomes like a, you know, um, a Gregory Peck from To Kill mm -hmm. a Mockingbird yes. type of figure, but even, right. it's yeah. even more subtle than yeah, that. Absolutely. Um, um, but he really, and, and James Stewart had some roles like mm -hmm. that too, where it, there would be this subtle questioning of, what are we doing here? And um, Hanks may be the only actor in film who really who brings that quality to yeah. the screen. Yeah. You know, uh, because of his age and everything else, but there's a kind of Americana. Right. And it really is a combination of Peck, um, Stu uh, Jimmy Stewart, mm -hmm. and some of the, the older actors right. that brought that to yeah. Yeah, the screen. I can't think of anyone else. No, no, I can't. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so. it just occurred to me when you yeah. said that. That's cool. Um, my next film, we saw it together, is uh, we're on one, two, three, four. So we're on, um, wait, hold on. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're on my number six pick. Okay. 71. 71. Which is a uh, oh, yes. movie with Jack O'Connell. Mm -hmm. It uh, takes place 
1971 in Northern Ireland with an English soldier getting caught behind enemy lines um, with with all of the uh, unrest between um, you know IRA, and, the and IRA yeah. and England. Um, it's one like Mad Max. It's literally a chase from mm. beginning to end, and I thought it was incredible that they were able to keep that momentum but also have these quiet moments in between right. to reveal some really interesting things i've seen a lot of movies about this conflict in the name of the father mm -hmm. you know all these kinds of films um this is the best yes in I my think opinion, it's, it's the best it touches on both sides um the tragedy of it uh, the complexity of it that it's 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 much more complex than just you know these guys versus these guys it's it's also these guys working with the other side in order to get their own side it's it's so complex and you just what's great about it is you just have one simple soldier stuck in the middle trying to survive yeah yeah so. and it's also very suspenseful oh my god um, yeah throughout and as you said it's the clearest film as far as i'm concerned right. um explaining and dramatizing mm -hmm. that conflict, the confusion of that conflict, I've seen, again, like you, I've seen more uh, probably than you have, I go back all the way back to shake hands with the devil right. and yeah. things like that, and I've never seen it presented in such a simple, straightforward, but confusing way, the yeah. way it, the, the situation is, and all you want to do is say, stop this, yeah. <laughs> you know, like this, because it's, it's madness. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that. But I don't, you know, the one area I don't say, agree with you is I don't see the comparison to Mad Max. Well, just because, I just mean that Mad Max is a constant chase right. yeah, from beginning yeah. to end. And mm -hmm. this was a constant yeah, chase just, from beginning yeah. to end. I like that in the first 10 minutes of this movie, he's running. Yes, he's running. And literally, he yeah. is running until the end of the film, you know? <laughs> so there were some similarities. I'm just saying, I see, I see what you, you know, and I would like to, at some point, I think it's a challenge to make a movie. It's a chase from beginning to end, but not just be action for it to have some complexity to it, you know. So mm -hmm. anyway, what's what's next for you? What's number My six? Number for you? six is um, Maru. Okay, and I didn't see that. Yeah, that's um, a documentary again right. about some men climbing this mountain that um, they say is really more difficult than. Um, Everest mm -hmm. and the reason for that is because it's so smooth at the top and you just watch these men who I, you begin to think of as super men who just take this challenge on and put themselves into circumstances that seem superhuman and just out of the sheer grit and will of their personality right. conquer it. Right. Yeah, and there's a lot I can say about it because it's one of those you have to experience with them to yeah. understand where they are. But I really, really liked it and I felt it was one of the best that I'd seen this year. Yeah, I, I've heard it's incredible, yeah. not just from you. So I'm sad that I missed it in the theaters, but I'll, I'll, I'll track mm -hmm. it down. Um, my next is another film we saw together. I need to stop saying <laughs> that because apparently we saw most of this year's yeah, movies together. Right. Slow West. Oh yeah, my, it's on my list. Too. Good. And, uh, then I'll talk briefly about it, okay, and, really and then we can it. you can chat more. But um, I love this movie. It's um, it's you know there's a lot of westerns actually being made right now. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, a lot of westerns came out. This is uh, I think just one of the coolest westerns, not just this year but for a long time. It takes a new approach to it. Mm -hmm. It's very poetic. Um, I say quirky. I don't want people to think the wrong thing with that. It's not a Wes Anderson film, right? But it has some quirkiness to it, some dark humor. And um, it's it, and the lead performances from Fassbender, and I can't remember the name of the kid. Yeah, okay, and then yeah. my favorite actor working right now, Ben Mendelsohn. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just got some great characters in it. There's some startling surprises in the picture. I've seen it again. Right. Um, that's on yeah, television. I've seen it a couple times too. Yeah. Uh, I watched it again, and um, they, as you said, the pace is slow because they're setting you up for a startling right. surprise. Yeah. What I think of it, I think it's one of the most pragmatic westerns I've seen. The other thing that's interesting about it is the look of the film. Oh yeah. Because they shot it in New Zealand to look like the American mm -hmm. West, and it's primarily Britishers in the West, but it gives you a whole different take on the western completely and yeah, i just does. loved it uh for that and i'd like to see it again actually yeah uh because it 
it doesn't do the usual setups mm -hmm. of um, you know stand in front of me and I pull my gun and right. we'll see who's the fastest draw yeah. or whatever. And that's why I said it feels more real. Well, it's got moments that are painfully funny mm -hmm. in the sense that the violence happens and we laugh, but we're, it's such a mixed feeling of yes. laughter and then sadness mm -hmm. and it's really getting some interesting that, touches That there. terrific shootout in that little store. Oh yeah. Um, so it's such a, a mix of sensations and right. feelings that it draws from you because the sudden the suddenness of it is the first thing that stops you then the, the extreme violence of it and then at the very end when they show you the kids who are just sitting there yeah you know uh it takes you to a certain kind of sadness and right. melancholy and at the center is um a tragic love story right you know that's the thing that really yeah. holds the whole thing together if yeah that, there's this tragic love story at the at the death and with a story. very unconventional way of wrapping right. it up yes. i won't say yes. what it is but um i also want to say you know it's the it's a feature debut mm -hmm. this guy's had not directed a feature before yeah, that's and right, fassbender right. has been working with him for years on shorts mm -hmm. and they finally decided to do a feature and clearly, Fassbender, who's getting paid the big bucks now, mm -hmm. uh, took a chance on doing yeah. a small Western. And he's listed as one of the executive producers exactly. on it, so clearly he was invested. Right, yeah. and I, I think that's awesome. Yeah. I just think yeah. it's awesome that they went and they did this and yeah. they took a chance on it. So, And it's on Amazon uh, for streaming, yeah. if right. anyone yeah. has Amazon. What's next for you? Number five. Number five. Well, Slow West. <laughs> okay. Well, then we just talked about it, I guess. Do you have anything else you want to say about it? Uh, no, I, I, I think I've said. I guess I'll do number four then. Mm -hmm. Number four is a movie I guarantee that probably no one who's watching this has seen this movie. It's called The Runner with Nicolas Cage. I now, didn't see it. Now, I'm a diehard Nicolas Cage okay. fan, and I will follow Nicolas Cage into the shittiest of, of his movies. <laughs> right, you know? um, because I really think he's one of the most interesting performers we have. But this movie is is not you know Ghost Rider or something like this. This is a truly underrated gem. It's about um, a politician in New Orleans, right after the oil spill, who gets involved. Uh, he he gets caught in an affair. It ruins his reputation, and then he goes on to try to rebuild it. And it's a it's the best movie I've seen in a really long time, maybe ever, about the ethics of politics and how you rise up. How you get things done, where do you compromise and, and, and don't. Um, it's very subtle, it's very quiet. I'm sure that's why it didn't do hardly anything. Mm. Again, it's it's just, you know, um, one of these films that th it's hard for them to find a place now. Mm. And I think with people like Cage, unfortunately, you know, because of some of his choices, no one takes him seriously anymore. So they go into the, these films not ready for the same person who gave us Leaving Las Vegas, and this is that cage, hmm. right? Who's giving a very um, complex performance. I so yeah, I really, yeah. I really think that you would, you would like it. It's, it's a very interesting hmm. movie, That's and interesting. again, made very small, played here for a week. I don't think anyone saw it, and it's on Netflix streaming. So, what is your number four? Is it four number four? Where yeah. At? Far from the Madding Crowd. Ah, and um, well, well, I haven't seen. Yeah, I, I've seen it twice, and this, this, this story has been told more than once uh, from the Hardy novel, mm -hmm. and um, I think Harry Mulligan gives one of the best performances uh, of her career. Uh, but just the adaptation, you know, they found a way to take this big sprawling novel right. and really shrink it and get the all the drama that is available in that right. onto the screen and uh, visually mm -hmm. also they got a sense of what is called hardy country yeah you know, so very very well there's a sequence where a series of sheep fall over a cliff that is just wow. breathtaking Jeez. and it's some sort of special effect mm -hmm. thing that they did but her performance is so solid at the center, you know. When I look at it, I hear, you know, everybody talking about strong roles for women and all of that. Uh, this is one of the strongest, and she plays right. it so well. And it didn't with, get any attention, no, or as much as it should have. Without, you know, um, trumpeting the idea, oh, this is a feminist perspective right. and all of that. She just holds the film together so well, and the plot revolves all around her. 
Mm -hmm. and the men who are in love with her and the mistakes she makes and everything else. And uh, the first time I saw it, I went back and read the book again because I thought, gee, you know, I have to be reminded it was just so exciting. And then I watched it again and I fell in love with the film more. Right. And so that's one, as you say, has just gotten fallen through the cracks. Um, right. There is the, the actor who plays uh, Matthias. Matthias, Hed yeah. Yes. I know him from a he, film called Bullhead. Yeah, he's wonderful in it. Right. Um, some of the critics attacked his accent and stuff. I didn't think there was any problem with it. Huh. And also, um, what's his name? What's the other British actor? That's Michael Sheen? Yes. Oh God, he gives a lovely, lovely performance mm -hmm. in the film as well. And so, as I said, it's a rich, rich work that could stand alongside, say, a film like ba um, Bridge of Spies. Right. Because it's a well-made, handsome film, yeah. but with a modern sensibility to it of an old, yeah. wonderfully classic well, novel. And Hardy is not easy to get. No, not at all. Many the people have failed. The only time I've I think it has been he has been done successfully was when Polanski did test. test yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's interesting attempts like the claim that yeah. Michael Winterbottom did. Right. Yes. But it, it misses. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard tone to get. And know? the other, I, I watched the other uh, version with um, Terrence Stamp right. and them, and that was a miss. That was John Schlesinger. Right. Uh, that was a miss, and there were a couple of other adaptations, but he is very difficult to yeah. capture on film, yeah. and I think they did. It, as well as anybody has ever done it before. I regret not seeing it, um, but I'm on the big gonna, screen. Yeah, yeah. I, but I'm gonna find it. Um, my next film. So God, know. we're getting into the, the the films that could all be number one yes, for me. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, I know this. If this better be on one of your lists, or okay. you know, on your list, I'm gonna check. Bone Tomahawk. Well, that's my number one. Right. Well, okay. well don't, don't don't spoil it. Yeah. Everybody's on the edge of their seats wondering what your number one is. <laughs> Bone Tomahawk, I think, is um, also another Western. Um, I guarantee you many of you have not heard of it. It's got Kurt Russell, Richard Jenkins, Patrick Wilson, and um, an amazing performance by an actor I'd never seen before, Matthew Fox. Mm -hmm. I never watched Lost yes. before. Um, this is... Uh, such a great western. I thought I went in think, hearing it's a cannibal western. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. This is Jaws in the West. And I, I, I heard that it was a horror western, right. which yeah. also is a no. stupid right. um, appellation. I don't think it's horror at no, all. No. Just like Jaws is not horror. No. Because no, no. Jaws is about real world things. Yes. And so is this. Um, but the reason I say it's like Jaws for me is because it um, brilliantly sets up suspense in the beginning and then takes its time for us to get to know these men and get to know them so well throughout the movie um, till we get to one of the most thrilling and brutal climaxes I have ever seen in a movie right? and um, by that time you know um, we really care about these guys mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so it's a very interesting movie and I don't feel like it pulls any punches especially in the character I mentioned Matthew Fox plays mm -hmm. I like that he's a racist and he um, doesn't ever apologize for being a racist, and um, the movie doesn't apologize for him. And I like that because that's the times that they're in, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and there's these different types of people in, in that yeah. scenario. So, um, you want to save your thoughts I'll on I'll save what I have to say, because I think you've said as much about the film as I want to say, but when I, when I get to talking about it, I'll, 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 I'll bring the other side of what I feel about it. Right, right. Okay, so let's pick back up with your number three. Okay, my number three. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the number three? It's oh, no, I know what it is. Duke of Burgundy. Okay, um, I can see. All right, let's hear it. Duke of Burgundy. Oh, it's on. Okay, uh, Duke of Burgundy. Uh, first of all, the film really was released in 2014, right. but it didn't play here until last year, so that's why I will call it fair, yeah. that. Um, the Duke of Burgundy is a film that either you go with or you hate. Um, it's sexually explicit, not, it's not pornographic, but it's sexually explicit. It's about a lesbian relationship. But it's also about um, sexual dominance mm -hmm. and um, how fragile that can be right. uh, in a circumstance. And the structure of the film is part of what makes it, because it's not necessarily linear. 
it leads you in one direction and it brings you in this other direction and it just really overlaps on itself right. and it plays off of a metaphor of the butterflies as well and you have to make the connections between the butterflies and the principles as well but the thing that the few films that we've talked about this that addresses human sexuality straight on mm. and the bypass that it can that it can take right. and um, more often than not we sensationalize it or whatever but in this particular film he just treats it like the norm and when I went to see it, I saw it at Film Bar, and there were maybe 18 or 20 people in the audience um, when it started, and by the end, I think there were only three, because <laughs> they were walked out. That's always a good yeah, sign. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, one, the film is slow, it's right. deliberate, it takes its time to get to where it wants to go. There were times when I became impatient with it, because I wanted to hurry it along. Right. But when it was finished, I was like, this is a profound experience in cinema that I haven't had right. in a long, long time. And so that's why I liked it so much. Well, I remember that when you first talked about it after having seen it, I haven't seen it, mm -hmm. you weren't, it didn't seem like it was something that you would put on a mm -hmm. list, but mm -hmm. clearly I feel it like resonates. it stayed yes. with yes. you for, yes. and that's the yes. sign of a really great, great movie, yes. is when it sticks with you. Um, my second is a film, I, I don't think you've seen it, you really need to see it. It's called Hungry Hearts. Mm -hmm. And I saw it on Netflix, I did not see it in the theaters, but it was released in theaters um, this past year. It has Adam Driver, who was recently in Star Wars, mm -hmm. and um, I can't remember the name of the actress. They both won Best Actor and Best Actress at the Venice Film Festival last year. The movie is um, about a couple who get married. The film almost starts like a romantic comedy and then uh, delves, starts going downhill into what you could call the horror of the human mind, right? Again, it's not a horror film, but at times it feels like one because it's about a woman who decides when she gets pregnant that she can't eat meat and she can't eat certain things and she starts to destroy her body. And then she continues to do this to her child after it's born. And it's about him trying to reason with her and save his child. Uh, it's really complex, mm. very interesting, disturbing. Um, some people compared it to Rosemary's Baby. I didn't quite mm -hmm. see that. It doesn't have that supernatural element. Right. Yeah. Um, but boy, uh, I haven't been so haunted by a film and um, I had heard a lot of hype about Driver being in all these films, Francis Ha, Girls, a TV show. Um, I was patiently waiting for him to surprise me. This is the movie where I thought, man, this is guy is a terrific actor. And he's on the top of my list of people that I hope I get to work with one day. Anyway, I think you should, you should check out the movie. I will try to look for it. Yeah. Um, you have to remind me because I forget that. I should right. actually write some of these things <laughs> down. Just so. My number two is something we saw together, and that's the, um, what is it? Stanford Prison Experiment. Which is my number one. Yeah, so. okay, so <laughs> that, we're up there. Because, um, again, that film, having seen it, I didn't know anything about the situation at all, but having seen it, I have talked about this film, I think, more than just about any film that I've seen this year. Right. Uh, because I've been talking to people and trying to explain the circumstance and then somebody would even say to me that it, um, they know the situation sort of like that, but not quite like that, not quite it. Right. And um, the sense of claustrophobia mm -hmm. that, and how people were psychologically transformed by the experience, um, I think was so, strange and damaging in a certain way right. that it expanded my perspective. It's the only movie I actually wanted to go, you know, talk back to them on screen right. and um, <laughs> interrupt what was going on. Yeah. That's how Stop, much... Stop, please, I, don't yes, do this. Or don't yeah. do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. And so it really got to me in that way. Uh, and for people who yeah. don't know, the movie is about an experiment that happened in the 70s at mm -hmm. Stanford where a uh, psychology department set up um, a situation where uh, students, volunteers, um, ended up 
basically pretending to be guards and, and prisoners. And they wanted to see how quickly um, power, control, relationships, and psyches would come into play. And uh, it turned out that within literally a few hours, things yes. started to get out of control. It's very much a lot of the flies right. kind of thing, but with a, a whole American taunter, I don't yeah. think he even was thinking of a lot of the flies yeah. when he did it. It's just that is so universal to who we are, our psyche. Yeah, you know, the power plays that um, we devolve into these kind of characters. Yeah, it's truly haunting. Yeah. I think it's one of Billy Crudup's best roles. Oh God, yes. yes. Um, Who is a very underrated actor. And he's also great in Spotlight. He was yes. another one yes. in Spotlight. But the, one of the reasons I liked it is we talk a lot about um, who are the really interesting American actors working today. Mm -hmm. What I liked about this movie, um, I, most of them are American. I know that some of them are Australian mm -hmm. or English, right. but the film features, you know, let's say 20 performances by men in their 20s, mm -hmm. right? Young uh, American, mostly American actors. And they're all amazing. Mm -hmm. So when I was watching it, I felt like I was literally watching the next stock mm -hmm. of great American right. actors. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those guys end up in some of these TV shows and films and really Moving taking, forward, taking yeah. hold. Because it was right. kind of cool just to see. It'd be like if you watched before any of the films, you saw a movie with Monty Cliff, Brando, mm -hmm. Dean, those yeah, kind of people yeah, right. in it. Yes. And they're not quite great yet, but you can see right. the energy. Right. energy right. Right. And raw talent right. transforming itself. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you said right. everything that that uh, that I want to say about that. But you said you had one more thought about Bone Tomahawk, which no, is the, your the, number one. Yeah, my number one, Bone Tomahawk. Um, my thought on it is that it's the f if for a long time I, I I think I'm indifferent to how films are released. Right. And after seeing Bone Tomahawk, which I saw at Film Bar, mm -hmm. which is always the port of last resort, right. so to speak. Mm -hmm. I was infuriated by the fact that this film did not get a, bit, a larger release, was not right. made more available to a larger public because I think it would have gotten a bit bigger and better audience. I had read some reviews on it and the reviews were all over the place. But after seeing it, I thought if this film had been playing at one of our better um, theaters here, it would have drawn an audience for itself. And so it seems to me like because they, they talk about it being a low budgeted film, but it's not that low budgeted to start with. Right. But it seems like because of the financial circumstance, the film has been shunted aside. Yeah. This very terrific film, the film that I had on my number one list, um, has been shunted aside and probably won't get seen by anybody. Right. Um, Kurt Russell gives a terrific performance in it and Nobody talks about that performance. They no. talk if they're going to praise his performance. They talk about hateful eight. Right, but and I haven't seen that. that but right. I, I, I'm going to say it without having seen that. This movie is just as good. Mm -hmm. oh, and I think that the people yeah. that like hateful eight yeah. would love this yes. movie. Yeah, and so that's that was my second thought on it. Is right. just that there's something wrong with our distribution system, whereby um, a f uh, well, there's a lot of people, but still when you think of the whole nation, a few people select the films that are going to get primary attention right. and the ones that are just going to be flushed away, really, because that's what happened with that film. Um, if I hadn't been able to see it at the film bar uh, on the big screen, I wouldn't have been able to see it. I might have seen it on television, right, right. but it's not the same thing. It's not the same not thing. Not at all. It is sad. Yeah. I will say on a positive note, the movie is on Amazon Prime now. I know. But and what I know what you're saying, yeah, yeah. but what I want to say is that I think realistically, movies like this are going to start having their lives mm -hmm. after their small theater run. At least it's there for people to see. You know what I mean? Yeah. And hopefully people will discover it now. But if theaters don't, you know, if, if, if a theater chain took a chance on a movie like this, <coughs> um, a theater playing it, is telling an audience it's worth mm -hmm. seeing. Right, yes, exactly. Right? That's what, and, yeah. and that's what I've learned from even my personal experience. Yeah. It's saying, hey, this is a movie you need to see. And uh, a film like this, I think, would have been a huge hit. And again, you know, one of the reasons I, I'm promoting the idea of looking at it on a large screen is because when you experience it, 
you experience it on a larger circumstance, a larger than life circumstance, versus when you see it on television, even with the larger screens, right. you know, and now everybody's watching it on telephones and stuff, right. and it's really just too small, well, you know, to experience the heft. To, like to me, the the size is not the is not what matters, mm -hmm. right? Okay. What matters is that you can't pause it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't yeah. step away from it. Okay. You can't walk into your kitchen. You can't you can go to the bathroom. You know, <laughs> but you when you're in the theater, you're immersed, mm -hmm. right? The lights go down, boom, you're there, right? I know when I watch movies on my phone, to me the size doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's that I stop it, like reading a book. It's a different experience yeah. than if I was in that theater. So I think that that's the purest form Yeah, but of watching again, it's a difference between your, your age and mine. Right. Because I really need to see it on the big screen. Right. And it seems to be reduced when I have to look at it this small. Right. Yeah. And I agree, but I do agree with yeah. you that the big screen is yeah. the best way to see it. And then that the Bone Tomahawk would not have had the same effect yeah. on me if it was mm -hmm. on the small screen. Anyway. That's Those it. Those are our best. Yes. That's it. So, um, I Maybe the next time we'll talk about performances because I actually had performances okay. as well. But the next time we'll talk about that. Yeah.